get started. And so welcome everybody. The live stream is on right now. Okay. Good evening, everyone. It's so nice to see you all here, especially in this beautiful state. I love, love, love this library. I love the smell. And so thank you for hosting us here. Um, we're going to get started. First of all, just if everyone could review the um, review the agenda. Is there anything to add, John? The education report will be read by Susan Burma. Thank you. And Dave? And the newsletter committee will also be uh, reporting. And newsletter will be reporting. Okay, so we'll have Susan reading the education committee report and we'll add the um, day's newsletter uh, at the end. Anything else? I don't forget if you uh, need to um, at the end for any unfinished business, which I don't really have. Okay. All right, so I would like to welcome our host, okay, Karen Taylor, to come up and do a little, a uh, little speak to us for a moment about this space. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are very pleased to welcome the Dodge Association of New York here this evening. Um, I did meet some of you when we had a short tour upstairs. So I'm just going to give you a very, though that you did not attend that, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of the General Society. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York was founded in 1785. That was 237 years ago. It was founded by 22 artisans. Um, this is now, we are now in what is our fifth home. Um, the library itself, when we first moved in here, um, it was actually a boys school. And then thanks to the generosity of Andrew Carnegie, the library was then added at that time, and that of course included the stacks that you can see, and a couple of extra stories on the top of the building. The General Society um, mission is to serve the people of the city of New York. We do this in various ways. We are a non-profit educational and cultural organization. We have a number of programs. Um, including the library, which I've just referred to, and was actually the first library that the General Society had was founded in 1820. We also have a tuition free evening school, the Mechanics Institute, that continues to thrive until this very day. And uh, Victoria, our executive director, was just uh, saying to me the, the tour, explaining the tour that, for instance, one of the courses that we offer, which is project management, um, which we only have approximately like 20 places, we've already received 200 applications. Other programs that we offer, and again, um, if you did not see it today, we, we invite you to come and see the John M. Mossman Lock Museum, which you can just see above you. Um, this is available to come and visit afternoons only, and you do have to make an appointment uh, before coming to see the museum. You'll find information on that on the website. Um, additional programs include our lecture series. We have a lecture series that uh, started off in 1837. And the lecture her on the topics of labor, literature, and landmarks, and also as a tribute to the 22 artisans who founded the General Society, we have an artisan lecture series. And as a matter of curiosity, um, how many of you uh, might have attended our lectures before? Terrific. And if you are interested in Please, please feel free to sign up on our General Society website. Um, I think I, I think I've covered everything. Um, I don't think I might do something, but anyway, I know that Victoria so comprehensively explained.
play uh, earlier on. So anyway, a very warm welcome to you and uh, enjoy the book this evening. I know we've been fortunate enough to have Rachel Rosie as one of our speakers, and it's a wonderful speaker and a wonderful book that she's promoting. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. It's much appreciated. And yeah, this space is amazing. And I, uh, I think one of the last times we had a meeting here, I got to the long collection. If you've never seen it, it's just um, fantastic. So much stuff that you never think. You have lots of all those different shapes and sizes. So yeah, it's really wonderful to be here. So thanks to our industry partners um, committee for getting this great space. Um, and Beth did a great job. It's our wonderful speakers. So it's really, I think we're, um, it's really a sign of uh, how much can, does and can do. And so, um, all right, so um, my address as usual, as usual, just sort of off the top, just I'm really gratified these days to see so many people working, and it's just fantastic. Everybody's at, everybody's about. I know the observatory is getting more and more crowded. We've got visitors from all around the world, um, and big groups are coming in too. I mean, big groups, big groups of international students, for example. A huge group of Brazilian kids the other day. Big groups of kids from Israel the other day, from all around the world. And the big Chinese groups are coming in too, which I never thought I'd see again. So it's really nice to see tourism is coming back and you all are part of it. So you know, keep posting, keep promoting um, your tours and yourself as a canyon vendor. If you have done a good tour and you've done something interesting and you want it to go up on the Gannon Facebook page, for example, feel free to post it. We've got that wonderful group. Tell people what you're up to and what it's all about. Okay, so this is really a time to show that New York is coming back and that you know we're ready for visitors, we're ready for tourists, we're ready for action. I think as it gets hotter, we'll all get a little creepy and sweaty, but for, for at least we're out and we're out of that. So it's really, really a good thing. So thank you all and um, you know, good luck and keep up the great work. Um, one thing I do want to mention is um, Jeremy right there. And Jeremy was on his scholarship adventures. He got sick and got sick. But through it all, he was thinking of our live streams. <laughs> okay. So through the pandemic, we started doing these our uh, live stream of our meetings. And now they are drawing to a close. Okay, we will not be live streaming meetings anymore. We really want to see people in person. But if you can come, please come to the meeting. It's wonderful to be together. It's wonderful to be, you know, get the four days television and everybody's all together, seeing and hearing and catching each other, you know, being in the same space. It's a really important thing. So we want to encourage members to attend our meetings again. So we're not doing the live stream also because it's just becoming incredibly burdensome and the burden has all been pretty much 90% of it has been on Jerry. So I think a big round of applause. Thank you. Keep sending the email, sending the link, resending the link, sending the link one more time, sending them again. I'm starting monitoring, monitoring the chat and then uploading the um, meetings as well. So we don't want to get rid of everything completely. So what we're going to do is we will be recording the first part of our meetings. It won't be streamed live, but they will be recorded and then uploaded. So that will include my rambling kind of introduction and then most of our speakers. That's really the, one of the highlights of our meetings. Um, the side thing is all of us getting together is also our wonderful, wonderful speakers. So the speakers will be recorded and then they will be posted to the Gannett YouTube, and so people can see that. And so, if you do miss a meeting, you, you know, you're, you're sorry to miss a speaker, you will be able to catch up with that. You'll be able to hear that. So, Jeremy will, uh, will, will, uh, will also be sending out an email and reminding everybody that for people who are not here at the meeting right now. So, that's really all I have um, to, to speak to you about. Again, uh, it's great to see everyone's out and about. And working if you're downtown, if you're taking groups to the observatory, come up and see me. I always love seeing 
guides upstairs. Um, but otherwise, let's um, we'll just continue with um, with the meetings. So that will come up at the industry partner room. We'll be in the Actually, I'm going to just thank our hosts again, uh, Victoria and Karen, because uh, they were really very generous with their time and helping Bob and me out take this all together. And just we're really lucky to be in this room. So thanks for the sunshine. So, so, okay, so in terms of the industry partner vote, so uh, this is a company called Kuntali World. And uh, if you have the agenda, you can see the uh, web address. It's utaliiworld.com is their URL. So uh, they're a peer to peer organization and uh, take a look at the website and you can vote. So we'll make the link available to vote. And I think we have 24 hours to do that. And then we can uh, inform you all if, if you all voted to accept them or not as industry partners. So that's basically it. It's a website that, that, that um, brings tour guides to the We both draw a profile on the site or through the site. That's simple to register. Okay, so post your uh, your own website to their site and then their clients will find it. And just clarifying, the email with the ballot will go out right at the conclusion of the meeting to all full members, and you'll have 24 hours from there to, to vote. So yeah, look, um, if you look at the website, it's a way to um, get yourself in another big database, and the um, tourists who are looking for tours, you can create a profile, and they can find you, and they book you through the site. So typically with these kinds of uh, uh, apps and these kinds of sites, they'll take a small fee and they'll help to be promoted with everything that they're putting in. So that's a, it's a lot, there's so many of these different kinds of apps. And maybe you see get your guide ads on TV, which totally blew my mind. Okay, so it's those kinds of things, one of those kinds of things. All right, so the industry partner, one thing about the industry partner program, they pay us a fee to join, okay, so we get a little money from these people who put their names on our website and they're welcome to come and speak to the members about their services and about what they're offering. So these are typically, especially when it comes to apps, they're typically international or they're overseas or they're far away, so everything's done remotely. But often when these people are in town, they'll ask to speak that one again so we can get to meet them. Okay, so like Jeremy said, the um, link will do, get the email with a link to vote. It will go to all full members, and then you have 20 hours, 24 hours to vote. Okay. All right, no more questions on that. All right, so um, I would like, is it, yes, Beth is going to come up again to introduce our speaker for this evening. So if we have a uh, Karen already said, we have a, this, uh, our speaker here is going to be really great. Um, so, so introduction, uh, our speaker is Rachel Bernstein, and her presentation will focus on the book that she co-authored uh, called Ordinary People, Extraordinary Lives, A Pictorial History of Working People in New York City. And she researches and teaches American working class history with a particular focus on New York City. And I hope I have this right. She is the director of labor arts, uh, which she co founded uh, in 2008, and it is a nonprofit using art, images, and events to bring a broad audience to this topic of overlooked history. So she taught in the graduate program in uh, public history at NYU for 25 years and continues to work on public history projects with NYU's Temple Library. So, welcome, Rachel. Wonderful to see you all. I have to tell you that you all want me to stand. I have since I was a kid, so 
explanation we give it and all that. And this photo was this big. So she walks um, from someone's bed um, to his granddaughter. So the search uh, for photos like this uh, can take you all kinds of places. Um, so and one other way that the book is the tip of an iceberg is it's a culmination of a series of projects, almost all of them had a title for my lives, um, that covered nearly two decades. Um, oral history interviews, a radio show, a survey of records that existed in different locations that were not very likely to be taken into archives, um, a series of workshops, outreach to people to help them preserve the records, an exhibit in the city hall in 1998, then went on to the Museum of the City of New York, traveled around the state, and ultimately became this book and the Labor Arts Web Museum, which I'll talk about a little later. Uh, my friend and co author Deborah Bernhardt initiated almost all of those efforts as head of the Robert and Franklin Labor Archives. He died in 1984 when my public history teaching the, to the archives she was in the midst of building and bonded over sheer belief in the usefulness of history and the power of ordinary people. How many people have seen this book? We felt a lot of people. When we first found it um, in the early 90s, um, hardly anybody had seen it. It was buried in the New York City Municipal Park. In the Department of Public Works collection, there are tens of thousands of photos documenting New York City public works projects. These must have been bridge, bridge painters, and these photos were like all before, during, and after of painting the bridge, um, paving the street, fixing the sidewalk, and so you literally have photos of sunrise and bridges with no paint. But there was this man there um, who was sort of brought to light about 10 years ago with a great book. His name is Eugene DeSalomon, and he was working from the courts, and he had an extraordinary hog for photographer. And this is, you know, his version of watching the same talk, and he wasn't about to look at the So, Photos taken by workers are much harder to find than we originally thought. This is workers on the Crescent Building in 1929. And it is iron workers that were taken by a fellow iron worker. And here we actually know the photographer. His name is Charlie Rivers, who's a machinist, a labor organizer, a civil rights activist, and an extraordinary manager. Who uh, photographs his fellow workers on his lunch breaks while working on both the price of the United States buildings? He was born Constantinos Capomaros in Greece. He changed his name to Charlie Rivers, um, and this might be something that will be familiar to you. He wanted to imply connections with Oha Indians who were known for being swift and fearless workers um, on skyscrapers. Yes, Charlie. Lean sewer pipe in Queens in 1920. There were very, very few uh, workers hired for these jobs in the early part of the 20th century. So, this team of African American workers is a bit of a mystery. And the mystery is compounded by a label on the back of the photo that says RC Pipes. If anybody knows what that means, please tell us. We're still waiting <laughs> to find out. Um, how do you find an image about discrimination? This may or may not be one, but it makes you think. Uh, the construction industry has been an economic ladder for the colors in the city, um, but the dangerous and dirtiest work has long been a vital source of employment for immigrants and minorities. And the building trades unions have um, won high wages, but still workers fought hard to improve construction and safety, and also kind of checkered the record in opening up membership to minorities and women. 
but people persisted. Um, and one of the ways that that happened was protests. And of course, it's easier to find images of protests than it is images of discrimination. The struggle to have community members hire construction jobs throughout the city has periodically been successful, but not without large numbers of activists marching and engaging in this world as considered. One of the women who pioneered in a long and still ongoing effort to open the only case to bring them in is Cynthia Moore. Her students being in admission to the electrician team, she was interviewed by my colleague, Bill Bernhardt, in 1980. And I just want to read you a little bit of sample of what she said. I had worked in offices. I had done these traditional female roles, and I didn't like all of what I considered garbage that you had to put up with. It was extremely low thinking because you'd be spending your money by phoning them over traffic for the office. So I came to the conclusion that the skill trade I would have more ability. I would also have a skill that would be at a good price. I was informed by an apprenticeship project that the electrician's union was opening up in June 1978. We organized a sleep out on the streets of Flushing outside the Joint Industry Board for six nights and five days just to get the applications. We were part of the first hundred people on that line, so we tracked a lot of media attention, as well as attention from our professionals who would come by checking us out. Most of them would say, This is men's work, heavy work. And I would say, Well, I don't think you need that much of you to carry a sleepy five or seven year old child. We're carrying wet laundry. We're carrying two bags full of groceries and six more water. We've done these things. It was very hard for these men to conceptualize somebody wanting to do this work. So I turned around and I say, Well, why do you want to do it? And they say, Because it pays for it. And I say, Precisely. That's what it's about. Um, this uh, story and some more from Cynthia Bondi's feature in that. They were arts exhibit called Sisters in the Brotherhood of Witches, um, based on a book of the same name by Jane Latour, which I urge you to check out. Uh, the way of looking applied in our type isn't reflected in the New York City section of New York City bookstores. Um, and People to think about um, who built the buildings, who, what were their lives like, what we know about them, like where, where can we find them? The second section of the book asks the question what jobs would somebody abide in New York City from? Um, and this was at different times in the 20th century. The nation's largest and most varied workplace is the largest manufacturing center, its busiest port, the plane of entry for the most. Number of immigrants, the most densely suited summer city of the world. Over the course of the century, it gradually transformed from skill based to knowledge based economy, um, from dominated by manufacturing to one dominated by finance and service sector sectors. So we tried to find images from key sectors. This one, um, you see that it's this important world. Um, there were huge range of conditions on the docks. None of them are particularly easy to work at, but um, bananas being unloaded was one of the most difficult. Um, Frank Barbaro, does anybody remember Frank Barbaro? Um, was a New York City politician, a New York State Supreme Court judge. And also the most unusual combination of former launch. He, he did a oral history of him, and he said, I never worked with banana dogs, even in the 1950s. Banana ships were being unloaded in the most primitive factory in that. And literally, that it was one of the few dogs where black launch were able to find work. He goes on to talk about the slimers, um, which were a key application of aspirin. Bunches. Cigar workers in a factory in lower Manhattan, 1918. 
later in the century, and we find this remarkably vibrant culture of cooperation between artists and writers and animators. Uh, you can label poster. Um, now more than 100 years old, um, and organizations and workers are still encouraging consumers to buy things um, made by workers who aren't missing. The Grand Strike of 1909, most of you have probably heard of, followed closely by another strike. Um, both of cloak makers, both were amazing demonstrations of solidarity among garment workers who worked in really small shops, sometimes 10 people in a place. So the fact that they would gather together um, was quite a remarkable thing. Those strikes, um, and then the Triangle Sugar Factory fire in 1911 um, really galvanized a huge movement in this country. And there is a uh, so, so labor about the ILG. Um, birth control, you might not think it's part of labor history, but of course, it, it is a part of it in the working woman's um, life, potentially. And initially, socialists and radical union organizers carried the birth control movement forward and were at the heart of it. Um, although later it would become separated as it seeks out the support of the medical profession. Another huge story. Conviction um, is something that happened during the Depression, and you know, honestly, we go back facing an eviction crisis in recent years. Um, radical labor organizers, communists, and socialists organized to stop evictions during the Depression and could gather outside um, where people were evicted and hopefully we were suffering. And create massive demonstrations in that the government created the police. Some of which actually came to be Union Square. Uh, this is an illustration of the first Labor Day parade in Union Square, which is leading up on its 140th anniversary this fall. So keep your ears open. Union Square in 1997 was designated a national historic landmark. Um, and here is what the plaque says. This site possesses a significance <coughs> commemorating the history of the United States of America. Here, workers exercise their rights to free speech and assembly. <coughs> On September 5th, 1882, we preserved the first Labor Day. Uh, Deborah Bernhardt. Um, is somehow for me is really a sort of leader in the effort to get Union Square landmarked. There was a celebration and a recreation of this initial parade um, when that landmark was finally made official. Um, so in September 1998, there was a recreation. One of the reasons it's such a big deal is that there is a very, very, very small number of national historic landmarks that have anything to do with labor and work. So the effort to get that designation was broadly. Um, two funny tidbits. One sad when we, there was a rehearsal of the speeches of Dignity in 1882. There was a rehearsal in 1998 on site. And so people came up and listened to the speech and said, who is that? I'm going to vote for it. And the reason is because if you could only be the signs, they're equal pay, equal work, no child labor, um, and other things that we have more laws about today depend on the So the funniest sign is political caps to that. Another sort of tidbit is that one of the 
even square to them um, to make the to go with the designation was to install a sculpture that was a soapbox. So it was famous for people who got up on their soapbox to see the stages. I know why that didn't happen. They were afraid people would lose it. Expression in the labor organization. 
in these periods of swing, unions organized camera clubs, baseball games, social dances, boat trips, book clubs, and much more. After the cultural and legislative gains that resulted from the strength of the movement in the 1930s and 40s to overstep us, there was anti union legislation, severe divisions, anti communism that destroyed large swaths of left organizations. The new sectors and new groups of workers showed up. Um, music is something that has been a unifying activity since the start of the and somebody really should write a history of organizing to a song. Uh, this is a great, uh, it was hard to find an image of the book, the song, without being able to sign it. Uh, but I, I love this one. Uh, this is the uh, you know, American Federation of Teachers and the Leader of the Day Celebrant uh, singing this song. And some of the songs are on the website. Ralph, how many people know Ralph Bassanel? Who's an artist, um, an outsider artist, uh, who was originally an organizer, a volunteer in the Catholic system in the Silver Day um, in the Spanish Civil War in World War II? He taught himself painting and he makes these very large canvases, extremely detailed portraits of New York City working class neighborhoods. I'm sorry. Is it is this work at the net? Is that your question? Yeah. I believe so. Yes. Really? Um, you know, the American Folk Art Museum had been exhibited at this, but and the net, I believe, has a couple of paintings of this. Yes, that's a good question. Um, and actually, do you know the net? I was just there recently. They have an exhibit of paintings done by the people who work there, which is fascinating. And that's a tradition that goes back for many decades. And speaking of art and the labor movement, the garden world, you may have a collaboration with the Metropolitan Museum of Art to teach garment workers art classes and bring them to the museum so that impulse to share art with working people has also flowered at certain moments in the history of the And actually, this is a photograph by Charlie Rivers, who I mentioned earlier. And I'm pretty sure that that kid is Rivers' son. So it's all in the family. Um, the culture of solidarity really included the later part of the 20th century, the civil rights movement, the anti war movement, the women's movement, all of which transformed the national political landscape and the New York labor movement. But not strike. These women are canvassing in support of the child. And finally, the in these districts, 65 workers are picketing in support of the, the incredible workers in Harlem, the picketing in support of the Wilbur cities in the South. Um, so, you know, underneath the third Alabama Bell. And if you look closely, you can see a sign in the window that says female lunchtime positions. I uh, also know New York City was not. You know, needed civil rights activism here, but at the height of the civil rights movement, the labor unions in New York City did an extraordinary job of sending organizers and canvassers and even large bands of trucks filled with pumpkin um, with doctors and equipment to help the civil rights um, workers. Uh, and the signs we we walk the eighties.
And I'm going to take a look at an image from last month and then ask you a few questions and then open it up to questions. Uh, um, so my questions are all really derived around the ambition to write a book that takes this story from the 20th century into the 21st century. And so I ask everywhere I go, what do you think the jobs are? Um, garment industry has to know this best of um, what would a newly arrived person to New York City find today? Or green food, um, some kind of precarious piece work like that. What, uh, what are the social activities? What, what's the equivalent of baseball and that outside? Somebody told me it was soccer and beans, but I'm not sure. But I think there are a lot of a lot of places we need to look for new images um, and to take the story into the current century. This image is from uh, last month. It was the 40th anniversary of a 1982 Carmen Worker strike, and there was a big celebration. Uh, there was a strike in Chinatown where 20,000 mostly, almost all immigrant, many of them not speaking English, most of them American, women and workers walked out and marched to Columbus Park, um, demanding that their contracts be blocked. It's, it's a complicated story. I will tell you the whole thing. But 40 years later, it seemed like a really important moment to celebrate a time when Asian um, immigrant women in Chinatown stood up for themselves, made themselves so, um, and actually won. So there was this um, event that included veterans from the strike, representatives from Amazon, labor union, Starbucks, and young organizers, and they also had children's tables. These, these kids were making kites. The photo didn't turn out quite as well, but it Tell you that another table of children's activities was a collage table, and the organization had Xerox um, a newsletter from Chinatown in the 1980s, and they had tons of copies of it, a nicely illustrated newsletter, and they gave the kids scissors and tape to make collages. So, as a public historian, I loved it, and it wasn't even that. Um, I would urge you to uh, keep an eye out for anniversaries. We're coming up with so many things. And every time I find one, I find it to be an excellent way to engage you and talk about the past. So, with that, we will open it up to questions. Oh, apropos, you said soccer in Queens. If you really want to see the modern day working class melting pot, go to Flushing Meadows Park on a Saturday afternoon. That's okay. That sounds good. Thanks for asking for us. Uh, I don't know if you call this a question, but I just wanted to add something that may or may not be coincidental or implied, but the one about uh, the Carnegie Hall meeting in 1916 about the women's uh, reproductive rights, that was the same year, you should know this being New Yorkers, that Margaret Sanger opened the first birth control clinic in the U.S. in Brooklyn in 1916. So I don't know if that was related or not, but it's interesting that's the same year. Huh. And also just to be a little funny and so off the picture of the uh, the workers was interesting uh, the 1909 workers because one of them the title said she was from county cook she was from where i'm sorry uh, county cook in ireland yes. and it's showing the kitchen workers and that's also the place that gave us high point mary <laughs> Thank you.
very short report. Um, July 16th, there's going to be a uh, Discover Brooklyn Subway Secret and Abandoned Stations. Um, we postponed the uh, webinar on how to price your tours with the trash boats. Uh, we rescheduled in August. And there will be a walking tour of Tin Pan Alley. The date will be uh, announced. George Calderado and the Kermit and AJ Stevens will be announced. We look forward to that. Um, get well wishes to Joe um, and the Ed Committee Zoom meeting will be the third Wednesday of the month, July 20th at 6 p.m. And thank you. Um, and thanks to Lisa Fisher for arranging um, this night to see these um, programs for Great University. And that is. Oh, the summit visit. I'm sorry. Um, I think I have to tell you something. I don't know. 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 I don't Nina, who um, is getting better, I'm going to um, this is good wishes to Nina. All right, so government relations. We continue to get 289A reintroduced. We're very happy to announce that we actually now have the contact in Council Speaker Adrian Adams' office. I uh, want to thank Ron Springer, yeah, member, uh, for, for, for providing that. So we should be able to get some clarity on the new rules for reintroduction. Find out just who the heck she has designated to reintroduce the bill. And in our communication with her, we reminded her of her. Long time support of 289. Now we're also in dialogue with the bear with me, Long City Title, a small businesses portal for the deputy mayor's office of economic development. And in this dialogue, the question came up what laws the city of New York can be guides in doing our job, our craft. The biggest obstacle is, of course, the straight code that regulates us. It is antiquated, and we will be sending in our commentary, our notes on the existing code in the hope of effecting change. Now, on Gag's Facebook media, I did put a request out. If anyone is aware of any other existing city laws that make it harder for you to do your job, please email me, government relations. Uh, at Janet.org. If you know the, the numbering of that law, that would be hugely helpful. Just telling me that, you know, hotels are supposed to provide restaurants. No, there's no law that in the city that requires that. Uh, that's like a myth. But uh, some of the things that we are going after will be, of course, the infamous zero limited to $1 per day. Yeah, we're going to try to get that removed. Yes, we we'll talk about the badges that you're supposed to wear. The city, of course, has these badges of at least two or three generations. Let's do the left first. Do you know that? Um, there are issues about the language. Uh, can we hear the warnings about taking our guests to houses of ill repute? Wow. We're not even we're not even prosecuting prostitution anymore. And gambling. I love the one about gambling. The city schedule we get three casinos in the next couple of years. And here's my other thing. You can't find this one. It always gives me a chuckle. Oh, just think about kickbacks, and we really do need clarification of that. Obviously, if you're a guy who brings your group into a business, and the business owner says, if you come back, I'll, I'll extend 10% off your group. 
That's not a kickback, but the word kickback just sits there like a sort of thumb in this ancient administrative code. So we do want that cleaned up as well. And there's also obscure language going back to the 2002 exam, which we got to get rid of. And again, if anybody else has any um, other ones that gets in our way, please let me know. And I know it came out on Facebook. Yes, your bus, your four buses can drop off at city bus stops. Stop asking. You should know that. But they have to go way to way away areas. They can't sit there. Just remember that in your phone. Any questions from the floor? Thank you, everybody. Um, next is industry relations. So that this is the start of the whole team. <laughs> you can't put me. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so a couple things. Uh, so first, uh, the site visits to the summit just popped up. Uh, we we had three of those, which were really popular. They went very well, and it's a very impressive place. So definitely take your groups there. Uh, they will love it. And um, we are working on another one, hopefully, in one in August. Yeah, we don't have an actual date yet, but um, definitely keep an eye out for the email. And when you see the email, sign up right away because they are super popular and, and it sells out really quick. But um, it's definitely worth uh, checking it out. So we are also planning a PDP with the Lenape Center in Inwood Hill Park on July 28th. And um, again, there'll be an email going out with more information about that. That'll be really interesting. Um, so we're also working with three of us, so Harvey and Bob and I, working on a, um, a call with uh, Lady Erica Sanger uh, at the Museum Association of New York because we are trying to um, get admission for guides with one presentation of our licenses. So that's something. And also, CIDA is coming up. Uh, the annual conference is coming up in August, uh, August 26th to 30th. So, if anybody is at all interested in representing GAMI uh, in, in DC, that would be really awesome. Um, and so, if you are, send a note. We'll get uh, okay. Yes, yeah, Studio Youth Travel Association. Um, it's not my area of expertise, but uh, if you have questions, if you have questions or if you're interested, send an email to the industry relations email, which is industry relations at gannett.org, and we'll have more details. And then finally, our, our, our uh, August meeting is going to be at the park in Brooklyn, so that's uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the park should be the regular Wednesday. It should be the regular Wednesday. So, um, and that's always fun, and it's usually very hot, and somebody gets gets in the water. You know, when the comes out, it's a fun, it's a fun meeting. All right. All right, we wanted to welcome two new members. I don't think they're here, but I figure I'll just say things out of them. Uh, we have Jim Han and Steve Lundis. I want to welcome them. And we do have a couple of recent members. If anybody is joining in the last two months, I would like to stand up and uh, introduce themselves. Do the best tour guide voice in the middle of Times Square and tell us who you are. Iron Jacobs right over here. Fantastic. Ronald C. Simmons. And Ronald C. Simmons right here. Uh, I wanted to read a quick report. I um, promised Patrick that I was going to write out what I was going to say, and I wrote too much, but I'm going to go for a little bit. Um, on Wednesday, June 29th, I attended a symposium about accelerating New York City's tourism recovery. It was run by the Center for an Urban Future and supported by United Airlines and Airbnb. Um, first thing I want to say is that we actually have 
secure permission for GANIC members to access the video of that talk. So I'm going to synopsize it really quickly. I think we're going to post it on our Facebook page. There's a very simple link. You just need to enter your email address. And once you enter your email address, they will send you a link. It is expertly produced. This is the green, uh, at the green space run by WNYC. It's cameras and graphics. It was awesome. Um, the panel entailed a wide ranging discussion about where we are now as a city and what can be done to attract more overseas in business. These are the two major metrics that are lagging at the moment. The total number of visitors is projected to be around 56 million versus 66 million pre pandemic. So we're about 10 million visitors short. Um, about 20% of the total is business travel. Most of that is concentrated in Midtown. So there was a conversation about um, focusing on making Midtown appealing to that segment in particular. Uh, much was made of the new mayor's sense of passion for the city and the recognition that, in general, big ideas either have to filter up to grab the attention of the mayor or originate from that office to have real impact. And this was from a couple of people who've been working with a number of different mayors. So that's an interesting perspective. Uh, a few topics were particularly interesting to me. Many um, on the panel felt that visitors needed to feel more comfortable in the city, both in terms of navigating confusing experiences and managing challenge, the challenging terrain of the post of the city. There was talk about needing better synergy between attractions and neighborhoods and more opportunities for new authentic experiences and spaces to be brought to the attention of visitors. Uh, Fred Dixon of New York City and Company then spoke with the Center of Urban Future the director of the Center for the Urban Future. So there were two brief opportunities for questions and comments. Uh, they were monopolized, and that's my editorializing. They were monopolized by friends and organizers, um, but I was um, a persistent little, boom, call on me, call on me, call on me. I had my hand up before they even opened for questions, and it was really obnoxious, and I got called on. Um, which allowed me to make it clear that all of those issues that they were addressing uh, could be handled by reaching out to guides in general and to in particular. Um, if invited uh, for fan tours and monthly meetings, I said that our membership would help to promote new attractions. Um, I said that guides bring comfort to the confused or anxious, so that they're often the ones making suggestions to guests and itinerary partners about what else to do when you're in certain parts of the city or when they want to know what the new hot or next big thing is. Uh, that comment was pretty well received and I was able to collect some business cards and follow up with interesting parties, but um, again, a little bit of my editorial message is not going to be here in minutes. Um, yet again, um, people really need to be reminded what guides do. They need to be reminded that the Guides Association is a robust and long-standing organization that does great stuff like this. Um, and so I would encourage everybody, every opportunity that they have to remind people about who we are and what we do and how we, even though Airbnb, United Airlines, and the real estate people and all of the big fancy money folks look past us, that we're the ones, like we like to say, we're the ones on the ground making things happen. And so I encourage all of you to keep spreading that message. I'm a guy and I've got arms, so you're covered. I'm an armed escort. I mean, I think, well, I think speaking as the membership chair, I don't really have the right to stand on regarding arms, but I mean, I think that if you just simply discuss the reality of life in the city and your experience and the experience of all the other people that you experience, that you are surrounded by in terms of the tourism moment. I mean, there's a few out there. I mean, that's the thing. That's what was coming from the people. Is that people are definitely pressing that there's a sense of fear. Whether it's founded or not, there's definitely a sense of fear. I think it's our role, and this was my point that I made in the 
at the symposium um, was that having someone who was an actual New Yorker literally guiding you through the city plays a hugely important role in making people feel comfortable. Uh, and that that, I think, alone should be almost enough to say, listen, I'm a New Yorker. I mean, yeah. you've lived here your entire life. I've lived here almost yeah. my entire life. And say, I I've lived here all of this time. I'm going to be able to show you how to get from point A to point B safely, because that's what I spend my entire life doing. So I'm not out here looking for trouble. If I see that there's a problem, I know how to get around it. Because I'm a New Yorker and this is my city. And P.S. I don't see that much trouble on the streets. So I think that's another thing that we can all work on reminding people of because the, you know what that's saying fear is real. Right? People out there are definitely fearful, and I think we need to go above and beyond and remind people that we're out there and see all the time, and we're safe. We're all still alive. It's, it's not like what we see in the news. Any other questions? Yeah, you don't want to get this talk in the room. Thank you so much for attending that. Um, I mean, it was really important. And like Jonathan said, just you know, remind people about you know board habits and the things that you can do. I had a, a woman approach me after when I chose at the at the observatory today and said, you know, I want to take my my parents to Central Park. And, What's the best way to go there? Where, where should I start? I said, what an entire guy. And she's a little bit you know, just a thought. I don't know a lot of guys. But then, you know, I gave her to the, the directions and stuff. But you know, be proud of our, our profession. Wear your language, wear your you know, your um name tag if you have one. I think John, do you have a language too? Yes. Yeah, we've got some language. If you don't have language, if you don't have language, you know, or you have a your name tag order and get your language, where your language, so people come back at it and get your guide and your supremacy. So, um, drum roll, please. We're going to have Dave coming to do the newsletter report. Hello, everybody. My name is Dave, and welcome to Kenneth. Good evening, friends. Welcome in. One long walk. So I, a member of the newsletter committee, with of course Linda Fisher, who not be here tonight, but she's of course an indispensable member, very essential, very valuable. So big question. Tonight, I'm here because the newsletter is out. Yes, I'm the president of the and I will be presenting this in a moment to our president. Now I should say. That the printers, we sent a proof to them, it's sent back and we prove it. But they botched this a little bit because on 2 and 11, they got a text right that they really washed some of the photos out. It looks like wet ink or something like that. But they went on vacation the day after I picked it up. They're on vacation right now. <laughs> and so it is what it is. The PDF will be perfect, but they botched up the printing. I don't know why, but a couple pictures just look a little washed. Everything else is fine. So, Madam President, please accept your presidential copy. Now, again, me, myself, and Jonathan will be happy to distribute them to those who are on a list. I've subdivided them. So, from A to somewhere in the middle of the alphabet will be myself, and then from somewhere in the middle of the alphabet to Z, Lacey Jonathan will be sitting next to each other, A, like that, to Z. Uh, so, uh, and also, if you're curious, for the moment, I have abolished the deadline. If you have something to contribute, for Pete's sake, don't wait, just send it in. So as for the list, uh, it is not obligatory to hit it when you are a member. Many people decline the paper copies, and many people go anyway. So you must request it of your own initiative, which means the address is inside, you write Linda at newsletter at gamut.org. You so put your name on the mailing list. You will have a sticker on your newsletter and it will be for you waiting at any meeting like tonight, for example. Questions? Yes, Linda. Yes, Linda. Yes, Linda. Yes, Linda. Yes, Linda. 
And please keep in mind you are welcome to contribute to the newsletter. Dave and Linda are always happy to receive articles, reviews from band tours you've been on, perhaps a good new book about New York or something you know, related to our work and what we do. If you want to promote it, want to write something up on it, feel free to do so and you send it into newsletter at gannett.org. So, uh, any unfinished or new business? Anything like that? Oh, not necessarily new business, but we point out this was on the table back there. Lock tech, does this belong to anyone or just the venue? What is it? It just says Logitech. That's like a remote. A little device. I'll leave it here if it's anyone. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Anything else? All set. Agent. Motion to adjourn. Any second, Jeremy? Second. All right. All in favor? Uh, All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. We'll see you in August. Thank you, guys. Thank you.